of all the theories of crime. The sociological theory has the widest acceptance and thereby criminology is rightly said to have originated from sociology. The modern societies have their own social order which is the result of the interactions of the various components of the social structure like race, communities, culture and civilization, beliefs and customs etc. Moreover, the economic activities of a society, both internal and external, form the core of social activities. Conformity to social order is expected of all the members of society. Any act of non-conformity becomes an act of deviance and is considered to be a crime from criminological point of view. This unit tells you about sociological approach to crime. You will learn in this unit about sociology, what it means to criminologists, contributors to sociological approach to crime, social structure and social order, conformity and non-conformity, sociological factors and crime, impact of economic development and sociological changes on crime. Now let us see what sociology means to criminologists. Sociology in very broad terms means many things to about everything of a society. From the very nature of population, its occupational ratio, male-female ratio, its culture and civilization, lifestyle, educational and employment opportunities, occupational pattern of the people, customs and traditions, religions and religious practices, family systems and family order and many more features of a society will come under the purview of sociology. The existing political system also will come under the purview of society. In fact, many social sciences like economics, law, criminology, psychology, philosophy, geography, etc. owe their origin to sociology. From criminological point of view, crimes, therefore, very much need to be understood from sociological point of view because most of the crimes are considered to be social phenomena. It also implies that if crime prevention measures are to become effective, the existing social structure and social order must be reformed. For example, more than 60% of crimes are said to occur due to poverty and unemployment. Poverty and unemployment are considered to be responsible for even female foeticide and infanticide. Not only the economic factors of poverty and unemployment, but also the pace of development becomes the source of many crimes like corruption and bribery, white collar offense, mismanagement of public funds and their misappropriation, crime against women and children youth unrest, etc. The modern society with all its features is always changing. Many changes are not visible in the short period, but are visible only in the long period. In the long period, in the Indian context, we find tremendous changes. In the long periods, demographic change, changes in the social structure and social order Improvements in infrastructural facilities and overheads, etc., are always taking place. Moreover, the great advancements witnessed in the sphere of science and technology exerts a significant impact on the society and on the very culture of the people. It must also be admitted in this connection that crimes also keep on increasing with increasing pace of development. Now we shall see the contributors to sociological approach to crime. We come across the contributions of many philosophers in this regard. Now we will look into the major contributions of these philosophers of the 19th and 20th centuries and see how far the prevailing crime situation is in line with their contributions. Professor K. Chokalingam says, sociologists made two approaches to examine the causes of crime. 
The first approach examines the relations between crime and social structure or social organization. That is how crime is related to the social system or how does a crime occur in a society is examined in the first approach. The second approach examines why a particular individual deviates from the generally accepted social norms when many others have accepted them. This question is more logical than the first question. Among the contributors in this regard, Karl Marx is cited as the first philosopher of the 19th century who upheld the view that private ownership of capital was the fundamental cause for all kinds of social evils, including crimes. But he did not construct a theory of criminology on this basis. His contention was that in a capitalist society, everyone is self-centered and therefore conflict of individual interest leads to social conflict. Private ownership of capital in turn leads to unequal distribution of national income in the Marxian sense. These socialist thoughts of Karl Marx are widely accepted from sociological point of view. Besides the Marxian socialist thoughts, we have the contributions of Frank Tannenbaum, William Bonger, Emily Durkheim, etc., who have directly linked their theories to crime from sociological point of view. Very strangely enough, Tannenbaum and William Bonger of the 20th century are of the view that it is a society or social environment which creates the criminals and that if crimes are to be prevented, then the social environment needs to be changed. Bonger is in support of these views of Tannenbaum, but he relates crime to development. Bonger's views are in line with the Marxian philosophy. He considers that the capitalist economic system creates criminal tendencies on the part of some sections of society who do not have adequate access to the means of production and other assets. Yet some criminologists have related crime with levels of poverty and unemployment. Dwayvedi confirms this view that social forces like poverty and unemployment, the educational system, job market, the political system, families, friends, peers and even random events like accidents all exert an influence on the individual. He further states, we must bear in mind that a society that successfully keeps 80 to 90 percent of its population on the right side of the law may find that it needs other measures to deter the remaining 10 to 20 percent. Emily Durkheim is of the opinion that crimes are the inevitable result of the interactions of various social forces. Now let us look into the social structure and social order. It is necessary to understand the social structure and the social order before proceeding to an analysis of sociological background of crime. Social structure refers to the various components of a society. Any society at any time has its own structure and order. The components of social structure are family and family system, that is joint families or single families, caste, communities and rural urban societies, components of rural and urban population, economic system, administration, religion, customs and conventions, institutions like marriage, family festivals and rituals, police system, educational institutions and educational system. The nature of these components of a society may vary from one society to another society and also within the same society from one time to another. However, these components exist in a society in some form or other. Now let us pass on to the social order and its interactions, frictions and conflicts. Social order refers to the interactions of these social components 
for example, family to family interactions, caste and community interactions, interactions between rural and urban societies, interactions among economic divisions, interactions between different religions, etc. Moreover, social order also means how the various economic activities are carried on in a society, how marriages are conducted, how people are occupied in different jobs or professions and so on. It further means how the political system of the society functions. Assuming that there is democracy in the country, the political order also forms part of the social order. However, if there are different political systems like monarchy, socialism or communism, the social order may also be different. For example, the social order of the United States is quite different from that of India, although both countries are democracies. Similarly, the social order of India is different from that of China and many other countries. Thus, the social order may differ from country to country. The prevailing social order of a society at any time depends on the interactions of the various components of the society over centuries. The prevailing social order in India is definitely different from what it ought to have been a century or two centuries back or even half a century back. Now, what is the significance of social structure and social order from the criminological point of view? It depends on whether the components or units of the society are in conformity with each other or in frictions with each other. This is governed by two factors, namely self-interest and common interest. When self-interest exceeds its limits, it becomes selfishness. If most people in a society are too selfish, then the existing social order also will have more criminality between individuals and between groups. This may be called social conflict. When social conflict takes an extreme form, it becomes extremism and fundamentalism. So, we have all these conflicts in the present social order and consequent crimes. Now, let us pass on to conformity and non-conformity. An act becomes a crime when it is not only forbidden by the society, but also a certain punishment is prescribed in the law books. The Indian Penal Code has defined various categories of crimes such as offences against property, against human body, against women and children, against the government, against the nation, against defence force, etc. Hunt has prescribed appropriate punishments for each category of crime. Every organisation, family, society, school, government and government departments, the corporate and banking sectors all have their own rules and regulations. Conformity to these rules and regulations is generally expected from all the members. There may be unwritten rules along with written rules and regulations. However, a cent person conformity to these rules and regulations and the laws of the land is not obtained in all the societies because at least a small percentage of people find themselves in conflict for reasons of their own. This gives rise to non-conformity on the part of the small minority of people to the rules and laws of the land and leads them to the world of criminality. Robert K. Merton's threefold classifications of social organizations are a social organizations with well-defined objectives, b social organizations with not only objectives but also with well-defined means and c social organizations which lie in between these two boundaries. It is contended that a vast majority of the people stick to B while a small minority take to A or C. In conclusion, we can say the more the conformity, 
the less the criminality and vice versa. That is, the less the conformity, the more the criminality. Now, we shall pass on to the sociological factors on crime. Let us see the impact of economic development on crime. Economic growth and development have brought many changes in the macroeconomic parameters like the national income, per capita income, aggregate production, total investment, savings, employment levels, etc. Development brings structural changes in the economic system. Since the five-year plans were launched, the national income and per capita income have been steadily increasing. No doubt, prices also are increasing. Today, an average building worker earns a daily wage of rupees 500 to 600, which is many times greater than what their counterparts were getting some 20 years or 30 years back. This is true with almost everyone, excepting the agriculturists, who are under the spell of the vagaries of the monsoon. Similarly, most other parameters have also increased in varying proportions. Living standards of the present generations is definitely higher than what it was for the early generation. Better health parameters, improved infrastructures like transport and communication, better overheads like educational facilities, medical facilities, all present a rosy picture of the economic system on the one side. Now to the other side of development. The process of development creates structural changes resulting in changing equations of values. This often leads to restlessness on the part of some sections of society who do not gain on equal footing. Tremendous increase in the volume of money supply and its circulation in mostly out of proportion to the rate of economic growth results in vast gap between highest range of incomes and lowest range of incomes. This becomes so glaring and hard to digest by the people at the lower levels. Paradoxically enough, India's gross national product has been increasing at a faster rate while the per capita income increased at a slower rate. This implies unequal distributions of India's national income. Geographical imbalance with excessive urbanization is created in the process of development. The urbanites enjoy better educational facilities, infrastructural and overhead facilities than those in the villages. Development process needs a huge government machinery under the control of the cabinet of ministers at the central and states levels. The huge government machinery consists of numerous departments, each with its own bureaucracy. Bureaucracy in India and many other countries is equated more with corruption than service to the people. The bureaucrats also enjoy undue privileges. The exploitation of the economically weaker sections by the stronger and influential sections becomes a predominant feature of the development. Inflation is an inevitable feature of economic development. Growth of money supply at any time exceeds the growth of gross output. When inflation goes uncontrolled and becomes double-digit inflation, the business community gets abnormal profits and acquires disproportionate business assets and personal assets. Speculation and hoarding of essential goods and goods in short supply are yet another anomaly of development. Unemployment is one of the greatest anomalies of the process of development. Technology keeps on advancing in the process of development. When new technology comes into practice, those with old technology become unfit for employment. Now the whole world is under the control of software technology, which has replaced the old hardware or has brought them under its control. Therefore, anyone who aspires for a reasonably good job now has to be trained in software technology. 
development process has also witnessed a great exodus from the rural areas to cities and towns in search of jobs. This has resulted in undue concentration in urban areas resulting in the emergence of slums in all the great cities and towns. A newly released census data of India says over 65 million people lived in slums in 2011, which went up by 25 percent from 52 million in 2001. Different states have varying levels of slums. According to the new census data, the population of slums in Maharashtra is 12 million, Andhra Pradesh 10 million, West Bengal 5.4 million, Uttar Pradesh 6.2 million and Tamil Nadu 5.8 million. The census report also says over a third of India's slum dwellers live in unrecognized slums. Generally, all the economic factors stated so far exert direct or indirect influence on the criminal tendencies of those who are economically exploited. All the factors stated so far act as push factors of criminality. If measures of deterrence are weak, which means the functioning of the criminal justice system are weak, the crime rate is bound to keep on increasing. The result is increasing crime rate in the urban areas. Now let us see the impact of social changes. Development process simultaneously creates social changes. The social structure and social order undergo vast and drastic changes creating new lifestyles and cultures among the people. First, let us see Hirschi's social control theory. As a professor of sociology, Hirschi has emphasized the role of social bonding which works against crime. Social bonding, according to Hirschi, refers to how the individuals merge with conventional social groups like the family, school, peers in the society. One who merges with social groups generally desists from crime. Hirschi's concept of social bonding is governed by four key elements. They are 1. Attachment, that is ties between the individual and the major social groups like family, teachers and the community. 2. Commitment, which means alignment with prevailing social order. 3. Involvement, which refers to the participation of the individual in the conventional activities. And 4. Belief, which reflects confidence in the moral validity of societal rules and norms. Hirschi's four key elements are in line with the concept of conformity, which I have explained earlier. Now we shall see the various social factors which may emerge in the process of development. The adverse social factors which act as push factors of crime are social disorganization and consequent decay of old social values, declining parental control over the children, greater exposure of youth to good and bad through media development, youth attracted towards life of gay, wine and women and reaching the borders of social order, restlessness and intolerance among many sections of people over what they could not achieve, greater sense of equality and increasing disregard or ignorance of law and rules and regulations, youth restlessness due to many unwarranted attractions, increasing school dropouts and increasing juvenileism, increasing opportunities for women and increasing crime against women, increasing rate of divorce and family disorders, lack of parental love and affection, migration of educated youth to other countries in search of jobs, disappearance of joint family system and its caretaking features, commercialization of educational institutions, unwarranted consumerism and increasing wastage, increasing juvenile delinquency, 
increasing crime against children, increasing number of slums and slum culture, changing political order with corrupt politicians and declining political values. These are the various sociological factors which act as push factors of crime on the sociological side. To what extent one is influenced by these factors depends on his or her self-control. Hirschi, who propounded the social bonding theory first, later developed the general theory of crime or self-control theory. Similarly, Godfredson points out that single most important factor is individual's lack of self-control in all the acts of crime. Not only India, most countries have this experience of development. The greater socio-economic development comes like a great wave in the long period and passes through generations. Therefore, the modern society has both its brighter side and darker side. Now to summarize, you have studied in this unit the various dimensions of society and their impact on crime from sociological point of view. You have studied about the meaning of sociology to criminologists followed by the contributors to sociological approach to criminology, features of social structure and social order. This unit also tells you about how conformity to the social norms and non-conformity are related to crime. You have studied in some details the impact of socio-economic development of crime from sociological point of view. Thus, you have seen in this unit all the dimensions of sociological approach to crime.